Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of cults. The interview was held on the 12th of June 2014 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session four. Welcome to our fourth session in our discussion of cults and cult leaders. If you're just joining us, we've completed three other sessions on this topic and you can find them in the playlist entitled Cults and Cult Leaders on our Frequently Asked Questions channel. I'm here with Jesus and hey, he's babe. going to be answering my pressing questions today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to everyone and uh, uh, it, should be, it should be quite simple questions, I think, these, these ones, yep. which we'll give direct answers to. Do you ask for money from people? No, I don't ever <laughs> ask for money from, from, for, from people. Um, sometimes people do, of course, offer us funds because they know that we do everything for free and, they, and of course we need some way to live. But uh, we don't go around soliciting funds and we also don't ask for anybody to donate funds to us. Whenever I, if I ever do ask for money, it'll, it'll be to get a loan, <laughs> if I ever wanted one. <laughs> so there are times when I, well, I might go and get a loan to do something and pay the person back or pay the bank back. Yeah. But aside from that, we don't ask for money from anyone. Do you charge for any services that you provide? No, we don't. All of our services are for free. When I say, when we say services, it's probably not the way we see them. We see them as gifts that we give to other people. And so we don't see them as a service that we provide, but rather as a gift that we give. And, uh, and we provide all of the gifts that we give uh, for free, as a gift should be. Mm -hmm. We feel that the divine truth should be available to the world for free. And while we spend a lot of money trying to make it available for free, with, you know, in terms of resources and other things that we need to make it available for free. We can, we can do that because of the generosity of other people giving gifts to us. And what happens generally is they give us the gifts to do it and we just go and use that funds to be able to share the divine truth for free with the world. Do you collect money at your seminars? Um, we don't actually connect, collect money at the seminars. It's more that we have a donation box up the back. Uh, we don't actually hand out a collection plate like people would, do, would see at a church or something like that. And we also don't uh, spend much time talking about money at our seminars, except if the seminar itself is about money. <laughs> but, so, but we do obviously uh, collect funds in terms of the donation box. But the donation box is usually up the back of a hall or something like that and people can place money in it if they wish, and, uh, and, and many people do. Not everybody does, around probably around about a third of people who come to our seminars pr place money in our donation box. And, uh, and then we use that money, we declare that money for taxation purposes mm -hmm. with, the, with the Australian Taxation Office. And then whatever after tax that we've paid with that money, we use that money to then spend on sharing the services or, or, or gifts that we provide for free with the world. Mm -hmm. So that's how we utilise those funds. Do you collect donations? Um, yes, we do collect donations. Uh, I suppose the word collect is probably not the right word because we don't go out and collect donations or anything like that. We just have donation boxes or we have uh, our bank account that's on the internet uh, for donations or, and we also have a PayPal account on the internet for donations and people if they feel motivated to place donations into one of those accounts or into a donation box at the back of a hall when we're at a seminar and so we, we get those donations and utilise them. We, you and I live on donations so we don't have any other source of income and so we're very happy that people can let us do or, or enable us to do uh, what we feel is a very important work sharing divine truth with the world by and, and therefore sharing our passion uh, with the world and and that they provide us the funds from their heart to do so mm -hmm. so we don't have anything like a collection plate handling handing around or, or we don't solicit funds we don't send out emails asking for money or any of those kind of things we feel that uh, if everyone values the material that we produce that sooner or later their heart will be motivated to help us out to, so that we can continue to do the work that we do. 
and we uh, use those funds for our own living expenses, mm -hmm. but we also use those funds mostly for, for pretty much all of the things that are required, expenses that are required to share the material that we present with the world. So, so what we find is that a lot of our funds don't go to ourselves personally, but in the end go back to the people who donated those funds to us. And what we do also is we place a summary of how we spend all of our money in the entire year from our taxation return, to, and we place our taxation returns actually on the internet mm -hmm. for the public to see. So we're completely transparent with everything that we do. What would you do if you did not receive enough donations to live? <laughs> well, firstly, I'd probably be surprised <laughs> because I feel that most of the people who come along to our seminars or listen to the material on the internet uh, see a, a deep value in the material we present. So I'd be pretty surprised if we don't receive enough donations to live. And it's been many years now since we've not received enough donations to live. But during the times when we didn't receive enough donations to live, uh, you and I obviously then had to find another source of or means of support of ourselves and uh, both of us are well qualified. I'm qualified computer software programmer, engineer. I've got uh, qualifications in all sorts of areas in computers and you've got lots of qualifications and, uh, as well. Uh, both of us are well enough educated to provide for ourselves probably in a, in a more um, ostentatious way than we currently do if we yeah. decided we wanted to go to work. So we don't, we're not afraid of work and we're not afraid to do other work. But, but of course, we love doing what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I feel I'm very, I'd be very surprised if we didn't receive enough donations because when you love doing what you do, the way the, the, the laws work of, of God work is that when you love doing what you do, you eventually receive all the things that you give away anyway in return. So, so that's what we find now. And we've done that now, well, ever since you've been living with me, which is yeah. now six years, uh, we've been living like this and living on donations completely. And I was living on donations before then, before I met you. So, mm -hmm. so it, it would be very surprising to me if we didn't receive enough funds to live on at least. And, and also uh, very surprising if we didn't receive enough funds to actually continue doing the work we do. The reality is that there are most people who listen and watch the material uh, f find it very beneficial in their personal life. And many of them are motivated because of that, f those feelings they have to donate the funds we need to continue it so that other people can also benefit. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably this is a great time to thank all of those people Definitely. who have given us the donations over the years and also who continue to donate to us uh, at the moment because without your, your help, we could never continue to do what we're doing. And we're also, you know, we have at times people donate significant amount of funds to help us in big areas. So there's times when we need some new technical, uh, new technology. Uh, at the moment, we're building a studio that one person has donated for some funds to help us to do. And, and so forth. So we really love to thank all of those people who have been supporting us over the many, many years that we've been doing this now. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> are there any levels to what you teach that are related to money? <laughs> For example, do you have to go to a new level in order to be presented a new truth or any new truth? Mm -hmm. Do you have to pay for anything? <laughs> I feel a lot of these questions are motivated by people's personal experience of other people who present information, particularly people who prevent, present so-called spiritual truths yeah. have a tendency to be very good at marketing. And we're not marketers at all because we do everything that we do for free. So no, there is <laughs> the whole concept of, is, to, of having levels is ludicrous to us. Yeah. But um, no, there's no way that we would prevent a person from from receiving any of the truth that we deliver. Obviously, there are times when we prevent them from doing so face to face. If they've treated us badly in mm -hmm. the past or they've been angry with us or something like that, then obviously we'd prevent them from being face to face with us in an interaction. But there's still all the material available for free on the internet and via our hard disk synchronisation service. And all of it, anybody can log on to those particular services and get that, that information. So 
there's nothing, there's no hidden traps that later on you're going to have to spend some money or, you know, that you get closer to God by spending some money or there's not the Catholic viewpoint that you've got to get out of purgatory by spending some money or, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. any of those things. They're all, that, you know, obviously they're all ways that uh, religion, you know, on the planet has, has fleeced the flock or, mm -hmm. or harmed people, but that's something, something that we don't do at all. And there's certainly nothing that we present that we hold back, is there, no. in terms of even if there's a small group present, we want the maximum amount of people to benefit from it. So we present it all and, uh, yes. on YouTube and on the hard disk drives yes. and things like that. And this is why we actually say to people, look, if you're going to come along to our seminars or any of the events that we have or be involved in anything that we do, you have to be prepared to have your face photographed or, or, or filmed at some point yeah. and to have that on the internet. And if you're not prepared to do that, then don't come along mm -hmm. because we feel quite strongly that everything that happens should be transparent yeah. and that everything that should happen that happens should be free of charge to anybody so there's no extra level that you've got to engage uh, no extra development you've got to have before you'll receive any more information from us but if you desire to treat us badly then obviously we will prevent you from being at our seminars or at our um, you know any of the other things that we pr present so, so that we don't have to put up with the face-to-face -face interaction with mm -hmm. a person who's just angry and, and also out of harmony with what we teach. But that being said, it, those same people, many of them are still watching <laughs> and, and listening from our website or from YouTube or from using the hard disk synchronisation service. So we still provide the gift to those people. Yeah. We just prevent them from uh, attempting to harm us in some personal way. But aside from that, uh, there's no restrictions that we place on the delivery of our material at all. And, uh, as, and since it's for free, then there's no levels that you have to obtain to obtain different material. Yeah. 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 And what about the issue of uh, moving through spheres of development? We often talk about that, don't of we? Of course, yes. Do you associate that with preferential treatment of no. certain people? Or? No. Well, obviously, I, I think... Uh, I think anybody in their right mind would enjoy the company of a person who's more loving to them than a person who's not. <laughs> so, you know, obviously I enjoy the company of people who, who demonstrate love or, or affection or kindness to, or compassion towards me more than I enjoy the company of people who attack me and belittle me and try to humiliate me and pull me down all the time. And I think that's pretty normal. And, and I also believe that that is probably the right thing to do if you had any self-esteem. Yeah. So, so, of course, you know, I am attracted to people who are more loving in their interaction with me. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean those same people are probably loving with other people. I don't really know because I'm not there when they're interacting with other people. I'm just there when I'm, when I'm interacting with them, obviously. But if a person is, uh, you know, in a higher development of love, you know, and, and we do talk about the development of love, of the soul condition of a person, and if the person is a higher development of love, then obviously they're a far more comfortable person to be around. And even if we have differing opinions, we can discuss them openly without attacking each other and so forth. And that's a really enjoyable experience. And I like enjoyable experiences the same as any other person. So, so yes, there are times when I prefer the company of certain people, certainly. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel that that is a wise thing to do. I prefer the company of people who are open-minded who also have a loving heart, have a desire to love, people who have a desire to, for truth. And I don't prefer the company of people who are either attacking or belittling or want to make fun of you, or are just people who are very resistive and, and always trying to resist truth or resist the fact that they've just been unloving or something like that. So mm -hmm. I don't enjoy the company of those people, so I don't spend that much time with them, mm -hmm. aside from interactions in seminars or, or some other thing that we provide publicly. So yeah, I'm a bit selective like that and, <laughs> and I'm sure that everybody else probably is as well. <laughs> and I don't see that uh, as an issue of my love actually for people. I still provide the same gifts to people, mm -hmm. whether they've treated me badly or not mm -hmm. actually. And th there's still the same potential available to all those people who have treated me badly as to, to those that have treated me nicely, yeah. ex with the exception that I don't, I don't have face-to-face -face contact with people who treat me badly. Mm -hmm. And that's the only restriction I place upon any relationship that I have with another person. And so that's not necessarily related to a number value of a sphere or a definitely, level. Definitely it's, not. It's just a very simple yeah. uh, 
Well, the reality is that most, peop most of the people who we relate to on a day-to-day -day basis have not yet learnt very much about love and have not yet learnt to have a love of truth either. Mm -hmm. And so if I restricted my, my you know, access to people who only I felt had a love of truth or had a love of, a love of you know, becoming a more loving person, then I'd probably have to be a hermit, you know, <laughs> uh, because there'd be so many people that I'd say, well, I can't be with you because that, that was unloving then sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But that's not what it's like at all. That's not what we're like. Mm. We're very tolerant of people's unloving behaviour with the exception that we always were trying to help a people, somebody improve their unloving behaviour. Yeah. And we're very attracted to people, no matter what unloving condition they're in, who have a desire for truth, who have a desire to, to want to grow and to become more in harmony with love. And, and that doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter to us what their condition currently is. What matters more is their internal desire, what, what they really want to do. Do they really want to change or any of those kind of things? You know, if a person really wants to change, then I'll spend quite a lot of time with them, as you know. Yeah. But if a person doesn't really want to change and doesn't really want to grow, no matter what condition they're in, I, I'm not that interested in spending a lot of time with them. Mm. Yeah. One key warning sign for a cult is that they ask for money for everything that they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Does anyone who listens to you have to pay money? No, not at all. No one who listens to us has to pay any money at all. And there are many people who listen to us who are even proud of the fact that they've never paid any money or donated any money to us. And I, 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 if I was you, if, if I was one of those persons, I'd have a good look at their thankfulness for what we do. Yeah. But, but we, don't, we don't pressure people to pay money for anything. And in fact, we don't pressure people to pay money at all. Um, you know, there's no pressure at all. Even when you go along to a seminar, as I've said, money is not, is not hardly even mentioned aside from us thanking people for their donations. And, and as a result, people are not solicited for their, for, for their funds or anything like that. And, and this is what I find quite interesting is a lot of people are very, find that very suspicious. Mm. Because, that, because that, that what's normal for most people is that somebody's always soliciting something. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got telephone marketers who ring you up soliciting you for something. And, you know, every single interaction you generally have in a business related sense is soliciting you for something and some payment in return. And when we don't ha require a payment in return for the gifts that we offer, and most people become really suspicious as if there's some other hidden hook or something like yeah. that. And I can assure people there is no hidden hooks with regard to what we do. We just present the information, what you do with it is up to you. Most of the people who listen to our information, we've never met. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the people, the majority of people who listen to our information have never uh, donated to us at all, in fact. Uh, and it's also true, isn't it, that a lot of the donations we receive we don't know where they come from. Correct. Well, you know, They're obviously anonymous. the person says a name or something like that. But in the seminars, uh, most of, all of the donations are anonymous. Mm -hmm. And so we have got no idea who donates to us from a, in a seminar perspective. And I think that's wonderful because yeah. it means it has to come from the heart of the individual. And there are times when other people donate oh, via a bank account or via, you know, by pay, via PayPal. And of course, then they have to have their name in order to make it happen. But but again, many times we don't know them or mm -hmm. know what, how the material has affected them or affected their life at all. Um, we just can want to continue presenting the new material. And there's lots and lots of new material, as you know, yeah. that we want to present. You know, even with these FAQs, there's like thousands of more questions I'd like to answer, which are going to take many more hundreds of hours to do. And, uh, and so obviously, you know, we, we will need to have the funds come in to help us to support us to do all of those things. But we are quite trusting of the fact that people of people's generosity mm -hmm. and we're also quite trusting of people's goodness. You know, there, there's a lot of people I feel who, who do feel an appreciation for what they learn and what what they listen to. Yeah. And, and we're very thankful for, for those kind of people because they are the kind of people generally that help us do what we love doing. Yeah. Mm. Many spiritual teachers believe that if someone doesn't pay something financially when they attend a seminar, then those attending won't value the material. <laughs> Do you believe that people have to pay for what you give them in order to appreciate what you give? No, I don't. I feel that there's people with very little funds or no funds at all. And many times some, I feel from them a greater appreciation than those people who have some funds who do finish up donating some funds to us. 
So, so the reality is that true appreciation of any material comes from the heart of a person. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel it's linked in any way to having to pay money. Now, of course, in the world we live in, the reason why that ha seems to be the case is that the majority of people in the world believe that if they've paid a bit more, have paid more money towards something, that that means that they have to listen more and it sort of motivates them to get as much out of it as they can. Mm -hmm. So when people come along to our seminars, sometimes many of them are asleep <laughs> because they don't want it, you know, they're not motivated by those kind of motivations anymore. And, uh, and sometimes they get a bit spirit influenced and they get influenced by other pressures and they're tired and whatever. And before you know it, they're nodded off and they don't, we don't worry about any of those kind of things happening because, and we also don't take it very personally. And the main reason why is because we feel that that's the measure of their desire to, mm -hmm. to have the material presented. And so I feel personally that true desire is not about money. But unfortunately, in the world we live in, oftentimes desire is about money. In other words, if somebody has paid money towards something, then they often have a higher desire to actually engage it more fully. And this is why many of the so-called spiritual teachers, and I wouldn't call them spiritual teachers, because hardly anybody on this planet is teaching about love. And that, to me, is the real spiritual mm -hmm. teaching. Mm -hmm. That's true spirituality. But these so-called spiritual teachers who ask uh, quite large amounts of money and sometimes exorbitant amounts of money to attend their particular venues and, and, and attend their particular presentations. Um, they're often doing so because they feel that if, if a person gives them more money, then it's highly likely the person will show a bit more kindness, a bit more um, interest, a bit more honour mm -hmm. of the fact that they have paid for the fact that they need to go there. Now, of course, in our events, that doesn't happen. So people come along and sometimes uh, some pe people try to rubbish us even. Mm -hmm. Now, if a person paid for an event, it's highly unlikely they'd ever do that. So, so, but if a person does do that to us, what we do is just say, you've got to leave. And mm -hmm. if you refuse to leave, then I will have to get the police and ask, ask them to help you leave. Mm -hmm. um, because we're not putting up with that kind of treatment because we give everything we do for free. Yeah. And, and so... I feel that uh, there is a lot of issues that the planet has about money and spirituality. And unfortunately, historically, there's been huge amounts of funds go into the coffers of churches and, and other religions um, from people who are very, very poor. And those funds have never been redistributed back to those poor people. Mm -hmm. and, and I can understand why many people think that some religious teacher and I'm not really a religious teacher. All I do is prevent, present what I call God's truth, and I don't view that as a religion at all. But mm -hmm. um, I, I feel that any religious teacher on the planet generally um, has had the, you know, there's the implication by, by because they are a religious teacher that they might take your money at some point. Mm -hmm. And many do. And from what I observe, there's lots and lots of people who do, but I'm not one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I do, and... All we do is we have donations at the back of the hall if a person wants to give it, or we have you know, donations available on PayPal or to our bank account. And people are motivated purely from their own motivation. We don't solicit it, we don't email them, we don't try to generate material in order for, for them to pay us money or any of those kind of things, which is what a normal person probably, what I classify, I don't think it's normal, but it's what the normal spiritual teacher on the planet would do. Yeah. And I don't agree with any of that behavior at all. And it's, I find it quite fascinating that I am often accused of behavior that I don't engage in when, when the very people who are accusing me are actually engaged in that same behavior. Mm -hmm. And I find, I've had religious leaders who actually take money from people through a donation collection plate accusing me of doing what I'm doing to rip off people from, for donations. And I don't do that. I don't do what he does. Yeah. So, so I find a lot of the accusations quite hypocritical as well. And these are some of the accusations I find hypocritical. Yeah. Just to go back a little bit, you talked about um, spiritual teachers on the planet often requesting a fee in order, because they say that makes their participants value the material yeah. more. I think that's you, an excuse to avoid their own soul's attraction, to be frank. But you were going to ask for No, no, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to explain say more that. About that. Yeah. Well, if a person comes along, uh, if a person does not appreciate material that you gift to them, 
then that's a reflection of the person's condition or your own mm -hmm. um, in the sense that you either do not value the material you present or the person doesn't value the material you present. And I feel in both cases, you can't manipulate a person into giving you funds just to make your feeling go, uh, that you're not valued go away mm -hmm. or to make them appreciate something that they that really they shouldn't have any appreciation for in the first place you know what i mean so so i sort of feel like a lot of this uh, money tra changing hands in the in the name of spiritual progress is all just very very fake and and this is one reason why you and i do not engage in any of this solicitation of funds you know or setting prices to come to seminars or setting prices to come to events or putting a price on every youtube video a person watches or even putting an advert next to each youtube video you watch we don't even do that mm -hmm. we don't raise any funds through advertising or, or other third party advertising or any of those things and the reason why is because we want it to be really pure we want it to be just focused totally on a person's pure desire to engage the material. And if they have the funds available to help us out to continue to provide the material, that they're motivated from their heart to do so. Mm -hmm. That's all we're interested in. So then back to my question mm. was about the quality of desire, because mm. you've touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to ask you to clarify. When, when a person is charged a fee, and they come to the event and they pay more attention, which is directly correlating with the amount of money or uh, the pay. fact so, that so they've say, paid a they, fee. Let's say, give an example, they paid a thousand dollars, yeah, and um, a, and that means that oh, I've paid a thousand dollars for one day. So now I'm going to sit there on my backside and I'm going to listen all day and I'm going to ask questions I need to ask and I'm going to, I'm going to engage this guy as much as I can get out of him is the, is the general attitude, right? Yeah, so there's this attitude of getting our money's worth, yes. getting a person's money's worth. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you about whether that is really pure desire no, to learn. Obviously not. So what's, what's the factor in play there? What's the factor in play is that money is providing a part of the person's desire to engage the process of learning. So the fear of? Well, that they've paid money and they want to make sure they get their, what they think is their value out of that money that they've paid. Yeah. And so they then engage learning. But it's not really true learning because true learning is driven by a pure desire that's not about money. And this is where I feel a lot of people fa fail to understand this underlying principle that a person who really wants to learn you, you, you couldn't, they'd, they'd pay everything they've got to learn and, and the person who really wants to teach would give it all for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't charge anything, that, everything that a person's got because they both would love the process. Yeah. One of teaching what they teach and the other of learning about what is being taught. And then what happens in the heart of the individual who's taught well, that's up to them. Like if they have some money available and they want to donate it so that other people can have the same advantage they have, well, that's up to them. And then even then that's a pure motivation because now there's, no, there's nothing they haven't already received that they can get from paying more money. Yes. That they've already received everything that is available. And so the paying of funds is now driven by their pure heartfelt desire rather than any other reason. Yeah. So I, yeah, I feel that it's very important that all teachers on the planet realize that every time you ask somebody for money, you are setting up a whole heap of very unloving interactions that are driven not by des pure desire anymore, but rather are driven by the fear of lack of money. And true learning can't occur under those conditions. And true engaging of what is being taught will not happen, mm -hmm. right? You don't in engage it unless you're truly interested in, in it and you have a pure desire to engage it and you want to change. Mm -hmm. and, and a person like that, why should they have to pay any money yeah. to change? Yeah. And, and my feelings are they shouldn't have to. That's mm -hmm. why we do everything we do for free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously in this world, most people in Western society need money in order to survive. How do you support yourself financially? Well, how we support ourselves financially is that we receive donations from people who are motivated only by their heart desire to give us a donation. So we don't solicit funds, nor do we demand funds, nor do we try to elicit funds, nor do we try to manipulate people into giving us funds. 
we just we just do what we do, which is present the truth, the things that we believe are true, to the world. And people who appreciate that uh, feel motivated sometimes through their own desire to give us funds. And I say sometimes because not everybody does feel motivated. You know, there's probably two thirds around about of people generally don't feel motivated to give us anything. But but of the one third who do, that's how we survive financially. So from those donations, we pay all of our bills. Uh, you and I pay all of our food. We own our own home and our own property. So, you know, we don't have too many expenses going out on our property, but uh, we still have food and cars and travel and all these kind of things to pay for. And all of the very generous people who feel motivated from the heart to donate funds to us, donate those funds and that's how we support ourselves financially. Now, how that all happens and the amounts that all happens in it are all recorded on the internet for anybody who wishes to have a look. If you have a look at the donations page on the website, you will find there a list of our latest tax return that we've had and a list of how we spent all of our money for the last year. So that way every single person in the world has the ability to see how we spend our funds. Mm -hmm. So we're completely open and transparent about everything about our personal finances. Now, um, we can't do much more than that in terms of showing people the sincerity that we have about money and also about living in harmony with the, with the principles we actually teach about transparency, truth and honesty. And we feel it's a very loving thing to actually sh show people how their funds are utilised and so that way they know what we're doing with the funds that we give them. But sometimes we buy clothes, of course, mm -hmm. we buy our shoes, we buy our clothes, we have our haircuts, we do all of the other personal things. But on top of that, most of our funds go to, towards things like, you know, purchasing of new equipment, purchasing of service space in, around the world and so forth, uh, sharing material to other people around the world, uh, updating equipment, um, building things, uh, things like our current studio that we're building in order to help us do everything much more quickly and, uh, and also more economically in terms of our time. And so all of our funds often go to those particular things. And what's generally left over is generally around 12 to 15,000 Australian dollars. And that's generally what we live on. You know, the rest of the money goes somewhere else generally. But uh, we always place our stuff on the internet and um, our, our accounts on the internet. And so everyone has the means of seeing what we actually do spend with and what, how we do receive all of our funds. Mm. So, you know, I can't, we, I don't feel we can say more than that. You know, if you want to have a look at the finances, frequently asked questions, it, it outlines how we receive funds as well. If you want to examine what, you know, what kind of funds we actually do receive, that's all on the internet. And, uh, and my feelings are anybody who's accusatory about us uh, receiving funds, well, I, I'd challenge you to put all of your finances on the internet in, for the public domain and put all of your life on the internet like we do mm. and, uh, and see whether you still uh, find yourself um, in a position where you can attack somebody who's actually very transparent with their funds. Mm. Mm. Many people who've listened to you in the past have now stopped listening to you. <laughs> yep. And some of them now attack you openly. Yep. Why do you believe they have done this? Well, in every person's case uh, that I know of that have done this, where they have been listening at one point or even quite favourable to the information that I've presented at one point, and now they go around attacking me openly or publicly, every single one of them has, has usually received some direct feedback that they asked for from me, whether it's public or private, and, and I've given them the direct feedback, I've given them the opinion they asked for, mm -hmm. and they've reacted angrily to that opinion. And instead of feeling through their feelings of anger and rage about what I've said, and realise that that's actually covering over many of their addictions to mm -hmm. wanting to hear something completely different, they have instead chosen to then revert to attacking me openly and publicly. Mm -hmm. Now, I feel that these people are not practicing what I'm preaching to them, because I certainly don't do that. I don't, I don't attack people publicly and openly whenever they've attacked me. Oh, what I try to do is I try to just say the truth publicly and openly with every interaction. And, and I don't, uh, and I'm not focused on trying to pull down a person or belittle them. I'm just trying to show, demonstrate what the actual truth is about God's truth or love in terms of every interaction. 
and that's my desire. So, so I find for many people who have done this, um, they've always been generally triggered by one event or for some people, more, a few more than one events where they've asked me my personal opinion and they've expected me to say something completely different than what I've actually said to them. Mm -hmm. Now, that expectation in itself is a demand uh, and it's an addiction where they just want somebody to tickle their ear, you know, they just want somebody to say to them things that are like sweet nothings in their ear that basically mean nothing, that is not going to help them the progress, but that's really what they wanted from me. Now, I'm not that kind of person, as anybody who knows me knows. I'm not that kind of person who's just going to tell you something because I, I might be able to make you feel happy for a moment or tell you something because, you know, you want me to tell, it, tell you that thing. And I don't tell you things because I want something from you either. I don't want anything from you. I'm going to tell you, if you ask me the question, I'm going to tell you what I think. So don't ask me what I think if you don't want to know. <laughs> and there's other examples as well, isn't there? Not just when a person's asked you directly, what would be the other instance in which you would tell people the truth about what they're doing? Well, if a person is interacting with me on a private or public level, and they are coming into my space by their choice, not by my own. In other words, I have not invited them there. They have come there by their own, you know, desire or invitation. And then they begin to, you know, to do things with me that I believe are unloving. Mm -hmm. Then I will tell them that those things are unloving and I'm not going to continue the interaction with them unless they stop. Mm -hmm. And many of those people, of course, don't see that their actions are unloving, nor do they wish to stop them. And so I say, well, I'm stopping them then. That's it. From uh, I'm not having any more interaction with you. Now, under those circumstances, those people generally get very angry mm -hmm. because they, their addiction to whatever they wanted to do with me, which is usually in most cases, those people wanted to attack me or belittle me or humiliate me in some way and they now no longer have the opportunity to do so, now they try to do it publicly. So if they have a means at their disposal, like some members of the media have, then they go and say all these false things in the media so that, so that they get their you know, satisfaction out of attacking me, even though many of the things they claim are completely false. And for those people who are not members of the media who've come to a seminar or something like that, they then go around to their friends and tell all their friends that I'm a terrible person, they usually call me a lot of swear words in the process mm -hmm. and never go there again. But all of, it, all of it's happening because they're just very angry and they didn't get what they wanted. And what I find in today's society, particularly in Western society, is whenever somebody doesn't get what they want, they then criticise the person who didn't give it. Yeah. Now, I don't believe everyone on this planet should get what they want. I, I believe that a lot of what people want on this planet is out of harmony with love, out of harmony with truth, out of harmony with ethics, out of harmony with morality. And there's no way that I'm going to feed those particular things when I'm teaching something completely different. So, so any person who comes to me expecting that they're going to get certain addictions met or get certain desires met, who doesn't know me very well, will often go away very disappointed and sometimes quite angry. Yeah. Now, what a person does in their rage is an interesting thing, I feel. If a person who's angry then starts attacking the person who they feel made them angry, then they're not looking internally at themselves as to why they're so angry. A person who doesn't have any issues wouldn't be that angry. Mm -hmm. Anger is a, is a self-justified position to... to um, to, to stop a person, an individual, from acknowledging anything that's out of harmony with love that's deeper within them than the anger itself. And, and my suggestion to such people is, uh, if I was you, I would pause before you get all angry and upset with anybody and, and start to look at yourself and say, why am I so angry about this particular thing? And why do I feel that my behaviour is justified? In my opinion, anger is never justified, ever. And that's what I teach, it's never justified. So, so my feelings are any person who justifies their anger, it's one thing to have it, you can have it if you want it, but, but if you're going to justify your anger and then in your justification of the anger, attack another person, then all you're doing is making your soul darker, you're making the condition of the world much more oppressive, and you're adding to the problems of this planet. And my suggestion is if you really want things to change in a more positive direction, then perhaps you need to start with you yeah. and, and start with the fact that you have anger within you that you ha have obviously got from some childhood experiences that you're in denial of or from adulthood demands that you're in denial of 
And it's time for anybody who's in that state to actually start looking at that emotionally and, start, and stop projecting that onto the world, including onto me, because I don't need it, nor does anyone else in the world. <laughs> Okay, uh, let me talk you through a few more questions on this topic. Sure. There are people out there who would say, look, I'm not angry. AJ's just a mongrel. Or <laughs> but, but they always say that, but what have I done to make them feel like I'm a mongrel? They've, they've never got any statement of that. And the reason why is because I haven't done anything in most cases. And, and, I, and I suggest all cases, I've never done anything to harm them. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly never done anything to purposefully harm them. So, so why would they call me a mongrel? There's got to be, and, and unfortunately when you ask these people, they go, oh, he just is, or you know, he did something. And a lot of times then they lie, actually, mm -hmm. because they have to manufacture something that I did that I never did yeah. in order for somebody else to actually agree with them. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, can, I can't accept that kind of behavior in anybody really. My feelings are, if you think I'm a mongrel, then... I'm sorry if for using word that word, you use. now you've repeated but, it seven times. But if you, but think, <laughs> but if you think I am, then, then how about, you know, saying why? Like, and if it's just because I'm saying I'm Jesus, well, I don't think that's a good reason. And if it's just because I receive donations from people that they've given from their heart, I don't think that's a very good reason. Uh, you know, so say the real reasons why you feel I am. Mm -hmm. And when it gets down to it, the majority of people have no idea why they feel I am, they just feel I am. And uh, I find that very interesting too, because that often indicates that they just have no desire to hear any truth whatsoever, and anybody who tells any is just going to be a mongrel to them. And that's the way. And I feel those kind of people. You, you're going to. You're the kind of people who who cause this earth to change slowly, who cause the environment to change slowly. You're the kind of people who attack other people all the time because you don't get what you want. You're the kind of people who need to change a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I suggest you try to change. Mm -hmm. And you'll be a lot happier and so will anyone around you if you do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know? And it's very common, isn't it, for people to neglect to mention the personal feedback that you've given to of, them. They always do, yeah. yeah. But what happens with most people who have been, become angry with me is they neglect to mention the circumstances that were surrounding when they first became angry with mm -hmm. me. Because in most cases, they will have to say that I wasn't angry with them most, in almost all cases, I'd have to say, they asked me to tell them what I finished up talking to them about. Mm -hmm. and, and they wouldn't, if they admitted all of that, then anybody listening to them would say, well, what you're angry about, <laughs> you know what I mean? And of course, so most people who, who are now angry with me don't want to do all of that. So they just make out there's some kind of hidden agenda or something, something that um, somebody else will actually accept as a reason. And, uh, and I find most of them are very dishonest. Um, in fact, and when I recollect the circumstances surrounding their first point of rage with me, um, I know exactly what was the cause of their first point of rage with me. And in pretty much every case that I've ever seen, there was always a first point when mm -hmm. I know that their, their mood towards myself shifted because of something that I said. And that something that I said was always something they asked me for they asked a per for a personal opinion on that particular subject. Okay, so let me just draw you in on that point. Mm -hmm. What if someone says, well, no, I didn't ask him a direct question right at that moment before he told me that whatever he told me. Um, well, in, my, in the majority of cases they have. That's okay. the irony. Yep. In the majority of cases they have. And the only other circumstance where I've actually told them something they didn't want to hear was when they were in my face trying to do something towards me, which was out of harmony with love. Yep. And what do they expect me to do under those circumstances? Of course I'm going to say something about that. Yep. So, yeah, I feel in both cases, one of them is the attempt to force me into a position of being abused, which I'm not going to accept. And the other position is they asked me for information. And, and which I freely give, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And they're the only two circumstances I've ever seen anybody get upset with me. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody get upset with me for any other reason than that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay, um, and I also know that you have a personal kind of a policy about public uh, feedback and private feedback. Certainly. Can you tell us about that? Well, I feel that if a person has uh, done something with me privately, where they've abused me privately or they've attacked me privately, then I will talk to them privately about that matter and, and 
you know, hopefully resolve that matter. If, if they don't resolve the matter and they still think that they can attack me privately, then I just say, I don't want to spend any more time with you and I don't. Mm -hmm. If a person attacks me publicly, then that's very, very different. When they start to attack me publicly or start sending me emails, which are all to my public addresses and so forth, then I start going, well, no, now you're not doing it privately anymore. Mm -hmm. You're doing it to other people and you're saying things about me to other people publicly and you're also attacking me publicly and I'm going to say something about that publicly. Yeah. <laughs> and my general view viewpoint is if somebody does it privately, I will, I will do it privately with them. If they do it publicly, then I must do it publicly in order to help people who are involved in the public interaction to understand the truth about the matter as far as I'm able. Yeah. And that's why I take that policy. And that also counts, doesn't it, for when somebody is representing, supposedly representing you publicly or what you're teaching publicly. Yes. So they may not be in direct attack towards you. No. But, but if, they're making, if they're misrepresenting what I'm teaching publicly, then I feel very strongly that I have to now, if I have the time and I'm, I'm able, so okay. there's always those pr provisos, if I have the time and I'm able to give my time to the situation, that I actually correct the issue publicly. Because, because that person is teaching other people that I'm saying things that I'm not saying. Yeah. So, you know, I can't agree with that. So I always will share with, about that with other people. Now, sometimes those people get very offended. And I say, well, stop teaching those things publicly then. Mm -hmm. You know, come and talk to me first before you start saying what, I th what you think I'm teaching. You know, because, because unless you're making sure of it, I'm going to correct it. Mm -hmm. Because there is enough untruth on this planet already without people adding to it. Yeah. And there's enough untruth, there's enough misrepresentation of divine truth and of myself and of yourself mm -hmm. and of everything we do. There's enough lies in the media and there's enough li people lying about us pub publicly on internet forums and so forth already for us to be a supportive part of that. Well, of course, we're not going to support that. Yeah. So we're going to do what we can. We're not going to worry about it very much, but we're going to do what we can given the circumstances and situations to correct that untruth. Yeah. And of course, we have a desire to do that because we feel very attached to truth. We love truth and we feel that truth is everything. Truth is what sets people free. Truth is also what opens people to love. Truth is what also helps people understand that there's a lot more to learn. And, and without the truth, none of those things can ever happen. Mm -hmm. And also, God loves truth and all of God's laws are about truth. And a person can't progress without actually learning how to tell the truth, recognise the truth and also practice the truth in their day to day life. So I feel telling the truth and saying the truth about circumstances and things are very, very important in our day to day life. Yeah. So that's what we do. <laughs>